basically the history of my scholarship is like the history of I wish I knew what to think about that and let's go figure something out um, and early try to get closer. So disability is part of God's intended creation. Uh, I've used this image in a few talks before. This is an image uh, uh, um, of Jesus with Down syndrome. And it makes some folks really, really uncomfortable. It's part of a much larger piece by the Russian uh, artist Race Mamadov. I'm sure I'm getting that, that wrong. What's a reconstruction of The Last Supper where every participant has Down syndrome. Uh, and while I don't really like the lack of racial or ethnic diversity in the image, I do think that there is something really provocative about thinking about what it would be like for the second person of the Trinity to become incarnate in a finite body that actually had limitations like all of us. So that that was supposed to be funny. It was just like, oh, here's build, build, okay, never mind. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. I'm on sabbatical. Like I talk to my dog these days. So, you know, so the central thesis that I want to, to get across today is that at least some disabilities are intended parts of God's creation and not simply the result of the fall. I loved teaching the DCM course back when we had interim. Uh, this idea of the, the narrative of the course as creation, fall, redemption, vocation, I thought was great. And this is where I started first teaching my disability course here on campus. And it seemed to me that like folks came in thinking about that course, we're gonna talk about creation. And then like there's the fall and all this disability stuff. And then there's redemption and we get rid of all of it and the whole course was basically designed around and here's why that's the wrong picture to have uh so i'm going to try and give you the crash course or a version of the crash course and why i think we should anticipate not only uh some disabilities as part parts of what god intended for creation but also parts of what we can hope for in god's eschatological redemption and completion of that creation uh, so my agenda, I always try to be um, fairly clear about my agenda. I think that's true. I often try to be fairly clear about my agenda. I'm, I'm going to spend most of my time today contrasting three ways of thinking about disability in the fall. Um, the one that I've just indicated, and I'm going to spend a lot of time why I think that that's problematic, and then one that gets a little bit better, and then one that I think is on the right track. I will end talk, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. I am immensely practical on a, in, okay, there we, go. Oh, there we go. Some of the practical significance of this, right? And how the way that we think about human value, God's intention for human bodies has theological, political, social payoff for the ways that we live together. But since I am a philosopher, I'm going to start with some initial conceptual precision. And I try very hard not to like get into the weeds of the next 17 slides being definitions. The next 13 slides are definitions. No. That's, that's not even true. All right. So some initial conceptual precision here. The first thing is I think it's really important to talk about the difference between disability in the singular and disabilities in the plural, right? You can talk about a person having a particular disability. You can talk about a person having multiple disabilities. Uh, but oftentimes we talk about disability as a mass term as it applies to all of these conditions. And I think that when we do that, we run lots and lots of risks of pretending that the range of embodiments that fall under disability all have something in common, right? So I think that there are some very important differences. And I've got a recent paper where I argue, Phyllis, you guys would find, most likely find this a boring paper. Uh, I think it's fantastic, uh, uh, but I'm weird. Uh, where I argue that we don't have a single unified concept of disability. What we mean by the term disability is in part context specific. And one of the examples of that is uh, what it means to have a disability according to federal law can mean at least one of three different things. <laughs> federal law is not even uniformed about what 
disability is. There's a legal definition, there's an educational definition, and even for some particular disabilities, whether or not you're autistic in part depends on the context you're asking about. Because a medical diagnosis of autism and an educational diagnosis of autism aren't the same thing. And so sometimes when somebody asks, is that particular person autistic, the correct answer really is, well, that depends, I think. So I'm gonna try and talk very carefully about, this is why a few slides back on my thesis statement here, at least some disabilities. And what's particularly important here is there's a difference between acquired disabilities, disabilities that you don't have when you come into the world, and congenital disabilities, those that you do have when you come into the world. And when most of us think about disabilities, we often default to congenital disabilities, right? The, the picture uh, a moment ago um, of Down syndrome. If you ever have Down syndrome, you always have Down syndrome. <laughs> but most of us are, tend, I think, to default uh, thinking about disabilities in terms of congenital disabilities. But if I remember the data right in one of my books, it's only something like 17% of disabilities are congenital and 83% of disabilities are acquired. And if you have the good fortune to live past 65, the likelihood that you will have a disability or other is greater than 50%. So in my less optimistic and encouraging moments, I have uh, sometimes said that the, really the only way to guarantee that you don't become disabled is to die too soon. And I think that there's something actually roughly right about that with a bit of Tempe pessimistic spin on it. So I'm gonna say some things about disabilities that I don't think apply to all cases of disabilities. And some of you along the way will start thinking about particular disabilities that probably might get those right, but not get all the other ones Correct, and so life is complicated. First clarification. Second cl clarification, uh, there's a really useful term that was modeled off of other kinds of structural isms uh, just called ableism. Uh, this is a picture of Talila T.L. Lewis. Her work is absolutely fantastic. Google T.L. Lewis uh, sometimes. But this is the way in one of her blog posts, uh, or this is the way that they define disability, uh, define ableism. It's a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on socially constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, excellence, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted historically in anti-blackness. There's a fantastic paper I assign in my disability course by a historian last name of Bainton, which is about how the concept of disability was racialized and they used disability as one of the primary arguments against the freedom of the slave uh, 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 in, in US history. And there's a parallel for why women shouldn't be allowed to vote. <laughs> by the way, uh, uh, anti-blackness, eugenics, colonialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people in society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's appearance and or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, and behave. We want good compliant folk. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. One of the fascinating things about the definition of having a disability in the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is you have, you're, you're considered disabled for the sake of the ADA if one of three things is the case. You have an impairment that limits a life, uh, act, a major life activity. They never actually define impairment, which is super interesting. You have a history of a disability. A number of years ago, I wrecked my bike and had a, a, a concussion. Technically, I'm legally now, according to the ADA, still disabled because I used to have a TBI. Or this one's super fascinating. You are believed to have a disability by the people in your community. <laughs> and the concern there was for like burn victims and people with facial scarring, the way that the systems of who matters and how isn't just a function of people's bodies and what they can do, but of how we take their bodies. 
And so you can be discriminated against on the basis of ableism, even if you're not disabled, but the folks that are discriminating against you are the sy systemic forces discriminated against you think you have uh, a, a disability. Scholarly definition. I love uh, Maria Palacios. I, 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 I didn't, my, my 10 year old has way more Spanish uh, than I do. Uh, fantastic book of, of um, poetry. Uh, she's one of the founding members of Sins Invalid, which is a wonderful disability rights organization. Uh, she's got this fantastic poem. It's actually not in this collection, but I like having physical collections um, uh, called uh, Ableism. So here's part of her poem. Ableism is when you try to heal me and fix me and promise me that I will walk or see or hear or that I will be everything I was really meant to be. One day in heaven. Ableism is believing that heaven is a non-disabled place where broken bodies finally become whole. Ableism is when whole is a word. I got a disabled son who's going through some really crappy things right now, and I cannot help but think about this in light of him. And I realize that the fact that I'm a white guy that cries gets me credit in a way that it wouldn't happen in another context, but daggone it. Ableism is when whole is a word reserved for the non-disabled, or when you say that I'm beautiful or valued despite my differences and fail to recognize that I'm beautiful or valued because of them. I don't know how many times I've just been out in public and people have come up to me and thought it was appropriate to ask a complete stranger, what's wrong with your son? The time that the woman asked me that in the cereal aisle at Meyer, I just had enough. And I said, what's wrong with my son is he's growing up in a culture where you think that's an appropriate question to ask a stranger. And like, I was the bad person. <laughs> She didn't invite me over to dinner. I was okay with that. So a lot of what I'll be talking about is, is theological ableism. The way that most of us think theologically about at least some disabilities is rooted in this idea that to be disabled is to be broken, to be disabled is to be unwell, to be disabled is to be less than. And when we think that theologically, we treat people like that. That's going to be the payoff, part of the payoff. All right. So there we go. Back, back to the agenda. At least some disabilities are intended parts of God's creation, not simply a result of, of the fall. And so now with those initial conceptual uh, uh, tools in place, I want to contrast three ways of thinking about disability and in the fall and work you away from what I think is the most common, at least in our historical cultural context one, uh, towards something different. Disability was thought of very differently in the Middle Ages, by the way, right? Why? Because most people lived their entire life in the small town where they lived. They lived as family units. Almost all the work that was done was done, right? Either uh, as, as an indentured servant or, or right, in, in your community. And it wasn't really until the shift for how we think about productive labor in the uh, industrial revolution, that now disability becomes something to really find problematic because in many cases, disabled people are bad workers. And we determine so much of our cultural value. Culturally, we determine so much of people's individual value by what they can earn. It is, you know, the two groups of people that are exempt from federal minimum wage laws? Prisoners. <laughs> And disabled people. It is legal to pay disabled workers less than a dollar an hour. And Goodwill here in town does that. Never take your, uh, your secondhand wares to Goodwill. One of the largest employers of disabled people in the country. And they have a horrible history of, of paying substandard wages. So contrasting three different ways of thinking about, I don't know how I got off on that tangent, sorry. 
back to theology. If only what we paid people had some kind of theological importance. Never mind. <clears throat> All the sarcasm that's been building up the last eight weeks of the semester when I've not been teaching, come out here. A few weeks ago, uh, January series, we had Amy Kinney here. I like Amy. We had fun. First page of the first chapter of her book, Disability Curatives. God told me to pray for you, she says. Her words linger like cloying perfume in a claustrophobic space. God wants to heal you. She's undoubtedly thrilled with this opportunity. I've been here before. It never ends well. This woman does not know me. She doesn't have the intimacy that prayer or accountability or sarcasm require. I've just forced my sarcasm on all of you here, despite uh, perhaps a lack of intimacy. She simply interprets my cane as something that requires fixing and ropes God into her ableism. I love that. I've just finished, not too long ago, just finished reading um, The Bible Tells Us So. Anybody remember the author? I'm blank, drawing a blank on her name. It's the history of how the Baptists and the Methodists responded to the Brown versus Board of Education decision that right, made seg uh, racial segregation in the United States illegal. <laughs> we roped God into our racism too. Maybe we still do. <clears throat> right? This is the idea that she's expressing that is so common, right? That the thing if you're disabled to look forward to is if you're lucky enough, luck's not the right word, uh, if you are fortunate enough to be among the elect, right, to have that. And we often, right, I don't think any of us would like explicitly try to voice that picture on people, but by the way that we treat people, right, we make them feel as if the only way for them to enter God's full kingdom is to leave behind their disabilities. Now, if you happen to be somebody with an acquired disability that for most of your life don't have a disability and then acquire one, right? Then maybe that's the right way to think about it. How do you leave behind Down syndrome? Not quite sure. Our son's missing a little bit of uh, one copy of chromosome two. How do you leave behind a small gap that is in every cell of his body? How do you leave behind autism, dyslexia, neurodiversity? Maybe we can't. And maybe if we have a theological picture where the only way to enter heaven is to leave those things behind, we're not leaving things behind, we're leaving people behind. And often because we thought of them as things all along. I didn't plan that line, but that worked out really well. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I've got three kids, so I'm driving a lot, and I've got a dog, and so I walk a lot. Um, listen to audiobooks. I listened to uh, two earlier this semester by James Baldwin. Uh, fantastic. Love them. I actually love the other book better, but this is a great uh, bit from The Fire Next Time. He's talking about the way that the American church responds to issues about race and, and, um, uh, anti-racist activity in the civil rights movement in the 1960s and how so much of our church culture is rooted in these larger cultural things that we often don't really notice. The vision people hold of the world to come of God's coming kingdom and its fullness is but a reflection with predictable wishful distortions of the way in which they live. I suspect that many white folks, look, right, and I'm a white folk, when we think about heaven, we don't give a whole lot of consideration to our race. Oh, wait, that's because we're the dominant race. I suspect that a lot of us who are male don't give a lot of consent right, to our sex. That's because we're the dominant. And those of us that are non-disabled often don't give a whole lot of consideration to the fact that we build into our theological vision non-disability. Oops, I'm getting behind on my slides here. There's a few that have some notes on here, right? So this is sort of like the, the friendly every, everyday picture of this view. But it's Calvin. 
So we're going to do a little bit of Augustine. This is from the chapter entitled The Case of Monstrous Births in the Enchiridion. We are not justified. We do not have any reason to believe, uh, uh, to affirm even of monstrosities. And from the context, it is clear he is, he's thinking about human monstrosities, which are born and die, however quickly they may die, that they shall not rise again. Yay, all humans get resurrected. That, that, that's, that's a good part. Nor that they shall rise again in their deformity. We are not justified in thinking they will rise again in their deformity. They will rise non-deformed. And rather with an amended and perfected body. This is Augustine's theology. This is how deeply baked into the Christian perspective is. Augustine thinks that your body needs to be resurrected non-deformed. In the Middle Ages, folks started debating about what, uh, I still wish we had Christina Van Dyke on the faculty here. She is fantastic. She's got a great book. I should have brought it and put it in here, where she talks about um, a hidden wisdom, drawing on the medieval uh, uh, um, mystical tradition in, in Christianity, and especially women, uh, female mystics. Um, female mystics, I don't know if there were women, because I think sex and gender are different. Um, <clears throat> So I just had to spell that one out. Um, where for the Middle Ages, like a, there's a part of Aquinas' Summa where, where he asks, and he, he's writing this book to train the Dominicans, right, to become priests. So the fact that he has to spell this out means it was a live issue that fixed, right, whether or not women get resurrected as men. Sorry, whether or not females get resurrected as males. Because like Jesus' body was male and like Jesus' body was everything it needed to be. So like, don't we need to, re what age are you resurrected at, right? Number of hair follicles you have. More than I have. <clears throat> so th this is, I've got a pair of papers that I've published the last few years. One called uh, Defiant Afterlife, Disability and Uniting Ourselves to God, where I'm trying to push back against this theological picture that says we can't have disability in heaven. Um, and then another paper called Disabled Beatitude, where I say, here are the goods that we might think about disability actually positively con contributing, right? We cannot have a reason to endorse one view, but that doesn't by itself give us reason to endorse uh, uh, a, a different view. In the first of the papers, Defiant Afterlife, I track some of this history. I Not only Augustine, uh, I draw on Luther. Do we have any Luther scholars here? So there's a book that's translated into English as Table Talk, and there's three different versions of Luther's Table Talk, and which one is the right version? It gets really, really complicated, and it gets messy. Um, but, but Luther talks about disability uh, in that book. Uh, and even though there's three different versions of it, all of them talk about this claim that monstrosities, and I'm quite sure, because Luther probably knew his Augustine, that he was drawing off this, right, whatever the German word for monstrosity is, are not human, but merely animal. And there's a boy in his town, or uh, uh, Dassau, that very likely scholars think suffer, uh, had Prater Willie syndrome. And the question was, you know, like, do we have to care for him or can we just drown him and make our community a little bit simpler? One version of the table talk suggests that Luther endorsed the view that rather than being human, this child was an offspring of the devil. This is where we get the changeling myth. The devil comes in and impregnates women, often because of sin that they do, so that they bear a non-human monstrosity whose job is to re wreak havoc. And this is how we think about humans. So if that version is correct, this is what Luther says. I think he's a mass of flesh without a soul. So for Luther, not in the image of God, couldn't the devil have done this as much in as much as he gives some shape to the body and mind, even of those who have reason that in their obsession, they hear, see, and feel nothing. And if we think that people in our communities have no souls, aren't in the image of God, see, hear, and feel nothing, then like, you know. 
I also sort of go after Calvin too, right? Calvin's view, uh, 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 the highest human activity that we can be called into is union with God in the Eucharist. And Calvin has a very high view of what has to be the case for somebody to be able to receive the Eucharist. You've got to be able to like, like explain parts of the catechism. Hmm. What about those folks that can't explain those parts of the catechism? Or at least even for any of you, try to explain the Trinity for longer than seven minutes without saying something that hasn't been condemned as heretical in this history. <clears throat> I'm going to skip over Calvin. This is what I find all the time in my discipline, right? Um, most philosophy of religion either just simply ignores disability. I'm going to cite positively this book later, which is about evolution in the fall, co-edited by Jamie Smith here in, in, in my department. He's traveling today because he's Jamie Smith and he's always traveling. There is one mention of disability in this entire book. And it's what is needing to be fixed in God's creation. So most philosophy just, most philosophy of religion doesn't talk about disability. Philosophy in general, happy to talk about disability. That's a super interesting bit. Almost all, uh, according to a recent uh, survey about seven years ago, 10 years ago, uh, over 90% of people in the US that do philosophy of religion self identify as Christians. And only 20% of the discipline of philosophy as a whole self-identifies as Christians. And it's the non-Christian context that is much more likely to think about disability in the Christian context. So they just ignore it. Or when disability does come up, it's almost always unreflectively as an instance of suffering or evil that needs to be addressed in the problem of evil. We got to come up with something to say about how good God would allow all this evil, and we need all of these examples. So, right, we go to earthquakes, we go to, uh, philosophers aren't nearly worried about smallpox enough, by the way. 300 million dead in 100 years from smallpox. Over 80% of them were children. Love that stat. So in this paper that I'm writing with Hillary Yancey for the uh, uh, TNT Clark Handbook of something or other, um, we survey about a dozen recent introductory and, and broad picture texts for what they say about disability. And all of them either ignore it altogether or just use it as an example of the bads that we have to be able to justify. So disability is an ontological defect. I've got some words about that, but the provost is in the room. I will not use all of the words I have about that. <clears throat> Moral evil is related to free will as blindness is related to the eye's power of vision. Sorry, Matthew. Part of you is the equivalent of moral evil. <laughs> yes, you are, but not for that reason. Uh, disabilities are natural evils. Disabilities need to be prevented or cure. So this picture of um, disability as bad, as inherently something that is contrary to God's intention, is deeply, deeply rooted not only in sort of the lay theology that we live out when we encounter people like Amy Kinney in, in, in the streets, but also in a lot of our philosophical theological reflection. Uh, Nancy Iceland published this book in, I forget, 1974? I can't remember. Um, probably one of the best known books that to start uh, the theology of disability. I think it's a really bad book. It is super provocative for its title, but like most of it, I think is kind of a mess. But three themes she writes, sin and disability conflation, 
right? Like most of us are familiar that like Jesus scolded for people for making that conflation. But then every single time we think that disability is the result of somebody's sin and part of the fall, we make that conflation ourselves. This idea of virtuous suffering. And the idea, and the idea here um, is not that the people with the disability suffer, but it's that other people have to suffer for their kind of good, right? So it's the, the suffering doesn't go to the, per, or, sorry, the virtue doesn't go to the person, but to somebody else. I don't know how many times I have been told by people, you're such a good dad. Once for taking all three of my kids to McDonald's. It was a Friday night and I'm sure that they thought it was like weekend visitation. I had custody on the weekends. And uh, I mean, I'm dead serious. Like I guarantee my wife would not have been told you're such a good mom for having three kids by herself at McDonald's. But so many times people are like, you're such a good dad for loving your son. Nope. It's called parenting. I don't get the same comments about my daughters. I love them too. I do love my, right? But I'm not such a good dad because I am the, the way to show or to grow based on what Jameson goes through. Uh, and segregationist charity, right? So the idea that she also traces is that we often think of disability as these are things that we knew, need to do things for. And I see this so much in church contexts. Almost every church that thinks they need to start thinking about disability or theology of disability and the disability experience in their churches decides they need to make a ministry to people with disabilities. And it's almost always children because we infantilize people with disabilities. Right. And so the, uh, ministering becomes something that we do to these. I've got Ursula, I think, in my head now. These poor, unfortunate souls. Is that her that sings it? Okay. <laughs> so these are the three themes. Encountered by people with disability who seek inclusion and justice within the Christian community. It cannot be denied that the biblical record itself, some of you might not like this because she's going to say some bad things about the scriptures here, and Christian theology have often been dangerous for persons with disabilities. Right? You do have when the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, this person or their parents? And Jesus scolds them, right? Like, stop thinking about disability as equivalent to sin. And what's Paul do like three books later? What are his main metaphors for human sinfulness? Blindness. Come on, Paul, read your Jesus. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <clears throat> Amos Young is uh, another theologian that has done a lot for disability and theology, theology uh, and Down syndrome. Um, Young has a, a now adult child with Down syndrome. If, and this is him pushing back against this first view of disability as the kind of thing that needs to be healed, eradicated, because it's not part of what God intends for all of us. If there are no disabilities in the life to come, then that implicitly suggests that our present task is to rid the world of such unfortunate and unwarranted realities. Now, I do think that we need to be careful to like not go around and cause, right? Like acquired disabilities. Intellectual disability in the city of Flint, Michigan has gone up more than 400% in the last 20 years almost entirely among the black population. Let me think why. Oh, because we don't care about poor black folks and the way that they get lead tainted water. We should not give poor black folks or any folks, by the way, <laughs> lead tainted water. If disability is a reflection of the present fallen and broken order of things, the redemption of this world and its transformation into the coming eon will involve the removal of all symptoms related to the tragic character of life dominated by sin. And if you really, if we, we remove everything related to my son's disabilities from his life and the life to come, I honestly don't know what's left. Let's not have that view. All right. So this is the second view that I want to get at. This, is, this one's um, better. But as my mentor in graduate school said, comparatives do not presuppose positives. 
It can be better and still not good. <clears throat> Here's Augustine again, this time from the city of God. I mean, Augustine wrote so much and so much of what he wrote is not intended to be systematic theology. And so there's so much that you can read about Augustine and he's sort of like, if there's a view you want to endorse, you can probably find some passage of Augustine. Right? I mean, he just says all kinds of stuff. That's probably a bit unfair, but here's a place where he says something better than he said in the Intridian. Perhaps in that heavenly kingdom, we shall see on the bodies of the martyrs the traces of the wounds which they bear for Christ's, bore for Christ's name. Because it will not be a deformity, a monstrosity, but a dignity in them. Okay, we're getting a little bit better. And a certain kind of beauty. There we go, that's getting good. Will shine in them, in the body, no, not because of their body. Right? Okay, so like we're not great. This is a uh, image of um, Saint Lucia. Her eyes were removed. She's often depicted as a saint with her eyes on a platter. Saint Bartholomew, who was flayed, so he's usually depicted with no skin on his body. <laughs> Take that, Game of Thrones. <clears throat> Or uh, Agatha of Sicily, who had her breasts removed. And rather than being presented, right, walks around in many of the, uh, much of the iconography with her breasts on a plate. Might be harder to sexualize the female body if we did it that way. That was also a dig at our culture, by the way. <laughs> right? In the same way, and this is what Yong is thinking about and, and folks that have this view, in the same way that Christ's resurrected body bore the marks of the crucifixion, maybe we can think about resurrected disabled people as bearing the marks of disability. Now, for all those disabilities that we can't physically notice on the basis of the body, like I don't know what it says about that, right? So there's often a difference between what get called visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. And the terminology, like so much English is, is, is right, sight biased. Um, but like, I don't know what this says about autistic bodies. Do they bear the, bear the marks of their autism in heaven? I don't know, maybe they flap in heaven. I'm okay with that. <clears throat> Oops, I, I went. So this is uh, Yang. The answer regarding disability and the problem of evil can't be simply saying that God will in the end heal such individuals in, the gene in their genetic variation, as it is difficult to imagine how some, someone with trisomy 21, Down syndrome, for example, can be the same person without the chromosomal fit configuration. I think that's a good question, right? What percentage of your genetic code can we modify without it like affecting your numeric identity? In these cases, for God not, not to allow the trisomic mutation, maybe for God not to allow the appearance of precisely that person. There may be no way in this case to eradicate the disability without eliminating the person. I further speculate that intellectual or developmental disabilities such as those with Down syndrome or triplicate chromosome 21, trisomy 21, will also retain their phenotypical features in the resurrection bodies. There will be sufficient continuity to ensure recognizability as well as self-identity, right? There's, there's a way that uh, individuals who have Down syndrome tend to have certain familiar Facial features, flat nose, right? Some of the neck, neck ligament, ligaments are, are different. We can often recognize it. So that, right? What, what Young is worried about is if his son doesn't have trisomy 21, like he's going to be, this is to put it parochially, this is not how he puts it, but it's the same idea. He's going to be walking around heaven like, hey son, where are you at? Like he won't recognize him. So he wants his son to look like he has Down syndrome in heaven so that everybody can recognize him and value him. He wants him to look like he has Down syndrome. But Young thinks that the intellectual developmental disabilities that go with having, in most cases, Down syndrome, won't actually be part of his son's identity. Or to go back to Iceland, 
here is the resurrected Christ. There's like, there's a, a little bit of really good content in this book. Like, I think this is a great quote. <clears throat> here is the resurrected Christ making good on the incarnational proclamation that God would be with us embodied as we are incorporating the fullness of human contingency and ordinary life into God. By the way, I'm, I'm working on this book on, on embodiment for my sabbatical. Most of us who grew up in evangelical cultures like I did are way more Gnostic than we are actually incarnational because we think that like we'll leave the body behind. The physical resurrection of Christ does not end. The incarnation does not end. The assumption of the body means that for all of the rest of God's kingdom, the second person of the Trinity is physically embodied as a human. And you will be too. Don't think we escape the, our bodies. We're not Plato. We're not Socrates in the, in, in the Phaedo, right? But so much of us are more Gnostic and, and Platonic and Cartesian, and that sometimes uses an insult. Descartes was trying to be a good Catholic. He just failed in certain ways. But <clears throat> in presenting his impaired hands, oops, that should be feet. Wouldn't be a Tempe slide if there wasn't uh, at least one typo. I'm dyslexic. Deal with it. <laughs> To his startled friends, the resurrected Jesus is revealed as the disabled God. The disabled God is not only the one from heaven, but the revelation of true personhood, underscoring the reality that full personhood is compatible with the experience of disability. Love this. In the book, she's calling him the, re the disabled God. What's his disability? He's got scars. But after the resurrection, when he's got stars, he's got the big hole that like Thomas can apparently fit his hand inside or at a big gap. He goes and catches fish and he prepares fish. I want any of you to try to use your fingers once you've had a spike driven through your ligaments in your wrist. Iceland's in resurrected God isn't disabled. He bears the physical marks of having disability. He's not impaired. He bears the physical marks. So I like that that, right? It's getting better. But again, to quote Stump, comparatives do not presuppose positives. Our daughters sometimes fight over which of them is taller, like who is taller. I'm like, well, this one's right. Neither of you are tall. <laughs> You're just not. <clears throat> So, okay, third view of the first of my three-part of agenda, disabled beatitude. In much the same way that we might envision other kinds of diversity, or since this is Calvin and we have diversity and, and um, difference built into our core, which I think is awesome, we might envision other kinds of diversity and human difference contributing to the range of goods that God intends both. I mean, imagine like if we as a, as, as a, college or sorry university um thought that like we'd all have to leave behind our race right and in, in, for heaven we'd probably like that would be that would be strange many of us would find that problematic we think that race actually contributes something positive to god's kingdom yay let's go read more james baldwin um right but imagine we we're better at treating other we're not great better does not presuppose good yet <laughs> But we're better at thinking some kinds of diversity actually aren't just like things that God's kingdom tolerates, but are actually valued as part of God's kingdom. And something that God intended both pre-fall and for heaven. So too with maybe some, at least some, disabilities. All right. What language am I going to speak in heaven? I have no idea. God, lots, God seems to like lots of languages. But imagine, now most of us think that like a good thing about heaven is that deaf people will actually be able to communicate verbally. And we fundamentally treat ASL and other signed languages differently than we do English, French, 
German. Nobody likes German. It sounds horrible. That was a joke too. <sighs> Just kidding. Just kidding. There are some fantastic things about ASL. I can scold my kids from across the room. Our, our, our 10 year old, no, 12 year old is taking ASL at a school as her second language. Love this. Wouldn't it be good if Calvin had an ASL program? Right? Why think that heaven has to be auditory? What range of auditory frequencies do we actually need to have, right? Like the older you get, and if you've listened to a lot of Metallica when you were younger, it really, really loud, right? Like the range of auditory, right, frequencies that we hear diminishes greatly. How much do we need to be able to hear in order to worship God in heaven, right? What's the range of frequencies? I want a lot of bass, but you know, I can feel it. <clears throat> What range of visual light? I think this is a super interesting question. The typical human eye recognizes electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths from approximately 390 nanometers to 700 nanometers. That is a super duper narrow range of electromagnetic radiation. And yet we think that's what's important in heaven for people to be able to pick up in order to be cited. One of my favorite TED Talks, I forget the guy's name. He's a self-induced synesthete. He's got this really rare form of color blindness where he sees no color whatsoever. So he hooks up a camera to a bone conducting speaker and he realizes that he can start to hear color. But then he re realizes like if I had a better camera, I could hear better rain, right? So he gets a fancier camera. So he goes up to people on the beach and he's like, pick out Emily, right? He, uh, like, you need to put on more sunscreen because I can hear that you're burning now from your skin. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, right? Because his camera picks up the infrared radiation that we can't with our eyes. Do any of you think you have to have sonar like a bat in heaven, or radar like a bat or sonar like a, like a dolphin in heaven? We don't think that, right? I mean, it'd be cool, but I don't know that it's needed. Sonar would be cool. <clears throat> if sexual reproduction with genetic variation is part of the correct explanation for biodiversity, I'm giving you a conditional, an if-then statement. I think the antecedent, the if part is true. So I think that. So, right? God's got a good reason for creating the way that he did. So if God creates by sexual reproduction with genetic variation, then God's got a good reason according, right, to create such a process. But it is that very process that allows Jameson to have a deletion on one copy of every chromosome too. See, that process that allows for trisomy 21, trisomy 18, Angelman syndrome, right? And this isn't to say that every... Disability is a, revolt, a result of sexual reproduction via genetic variation and mutation, because not all disabilities are the same, but many of them are. So it'd be kind of weird for a God to think that he's got good reason to right, create according to this process and then to like degrade the results of that process. The biological processes that allow for evolution are the same processes that allow for some of these disabilities. Therefore, right, like, maybe God's got a good reason for allowing those disabilities. Good reason for allowing those disabilities. All right. I think I'm doing okay. How long, officially, like an, hour, like an hour and a half of the whole set? Okay, good. Sweet. I'm out of the pacing pro, right? Like, I've been sitting down writing for a long time. Practical significance. Now, I've already, I mean, I'm bad at sort of like boundaries. So I've already hinted at some of these uh, along the way. All right, but there is a very real tendency in our community, in our country, in the church, in the way that we think to instrumentalize people with disabilities. I, I've had so many people tell me, God made your son disabled to take, to get, to teach you patience, Kevin. 
Now, anybody that knows me knows I need some patience. I don't have much. If the theological virtues are gifts, though, that are infused, never mind, there's another inference to be had <clears throat> there. So wait a second. So, so suppose this was true, that God created Jameson disabled for the purpose of teaching me a lesson. Then Jameson becomes a prop. He becomes a tool. Against his will, without his consent. Do we want to worship a God that uses people as props for other people or tools for other people's benefit without their consent? Right, and the way, and, and uh, Kenny talked about it in his book, right? We often, this is why we have so many of these uh, special needs ministries. And the phrase causes me to cringe every time anybody uses this, right? But when we have disability ministries, special needs, they're almost always towards children because children are easier to take on as a project. A uh, great friend of mine, Carlisle King, I've learned so much from him uh, over the years. Carlisle is multiply disabled, including autistic. He says, you know what autistic kids grow up to be? Autistic adults. How many of your churches have an right have something to explicitly welcome and value and learn from autistic adults in your congregations? Yeah. All right. We think of disabled people as charity projects. We think of Barb Newman, uh, uh, who uh, died a few years ago. Um, uh, taught at Zealand Christian schools, worked for the CLC network now, all belong. Barbara's a wonderful human. Uh, she talks about, we need to not just minister to people with disabilities. We need to minister with people with disabilities and be ministered to by people with disabilities. Prepositions matter, Barb says, right? And so this idea that we instrumentalize them when they become the merely the object of our care. Now, I'm all for care. I'm all for compassion. I'm all for charity in some senses of the term charity, um, right? But when we reduce people to projects, so much of what we do with disabled people in the church is roughly problematic for the same reason that so many short-term overseas mission trips are problematic. They're really about us feeling good about ourselves and not about actually benefiting the people we're there to minister to. Nobody threw anything on that one. <laughs> Bring up like, what's wrong with short-term mission trips and sometimes people get upset. <clears throat> it limits our theological imagination, right? The way that we envision what the diversity of God's kingdom can be like. Hey, look, it's Jesus. I'm pro-Jesus. <laughs> Just for the record. Right, but most of us start getting a little bit more less comfortable when we've got Asian Jesus or Black Jesus or clearly Middle Eastern Jesus. Wait a second, right? But notice one of the reasons why racism in the American church is so easy is precisely because we have made Jesus white and our default understanding of the world. And that limits our theological imagination. In much the same way that for aspects of Christianity, when we reduce Jesus to male as more important than human. This is, plays out in how we think about women's ordination or women's value or all kinds of other stuff. Right, our theological vision is just limited by how we think about some of these things. And that limited theological vision then shapes our daily practices, right? Good, well-meaning people work hard to make special needs ministries to kids. Yay. And then they forget those disabled kids are in most of the case are going to grow up to be disabled adults. Autistic adults are less than half as likely to be members of religious congregations in the United States than non-autistic people. Why? Because of how the church treats autistic people. 
Our theological vision shapes our communal practices. And sometimes this is official, right? One of the things I love about Catholic theology is you want to know what they believe. Like there's this really handy book called the Catechism that's super long and you can go read what their official catechetical theology is. And it's super philosophical, super systematic, super well thought out in lots of ways. Catholics are supposed to participate in mass at least weekly because the church obliges the faithful to take part in the divine liturgy on Sundays and feast days and prepared by the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, to receive the Eucharist at least once a year, if possible, during the Easter season. But the church strongly encourages the faithful to receive the Holy Eucharist on Saturdays and feast days or more often still even daily. What Catholics as Christians do on a daily basis is rooted in their theological vision. Yay. <clears throat> Saying we should be more Catholic in certain ways is also complicated. <laughs> right? Because we allow the faculty to be Christian so long as they're Protestant. It is still the case, I am told, that even though the faculty handbook changed to make it that we don't have to be CRC or affiliated, the previous provost, that, right, maybe you have a different reading of the, of, the, of, the, of the documents, we would still fire somebody for becoming Eastern Orthodox or Catholic on the faculty. Our theological vision of community shapes our daily practice. Love this book. Um, when I said earlier that the only instance of disability in this book is negative, I'm going to quote something more positive from the book <clears throat> from my college, Jamie Smith, colleague, Jamie Smith. Christian theology isn't like a Jenga game. And it can be. Jenga can be fun. Theology can be fun. <clears throat> An assemblage of propositional claims of which we try and see what can be removed without affecting the top. Right? Uh, so there's so much of Jamie's wor work that I think is right. And I say this as an analytic philosopher who loves belief systems and propositions and what we should affirm and all this kind of stuff. Right, but we, re we too often reduce the Christian faith merely to our propositional assent and not our behaviors, our practices, our communities, this kind of stuff. Right, so he's pushing back against this tendency to overly rationalize uh, the Christian faith. Right, and then we like, well, if I have this view about this thing, right? How does that affect, right? How do I think about the human nature? How does that affect the incarnation? How does that affect women in ministry? All this kind of stuff. Rather, Christian doctrine is more like the grammar of a story held together by the drama of a plot. In that sense, the doctrine of original sin and the historical understanding of the fall is woven into the fabric of a story that is ultimately this, the drama of God's gracious interaction with humanity. Love that. Our theology and our faith in many ways is more the lived out love we have for the poor, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the culture, right? Everybody for the one sheep that is lost, even at the expense of leaving behind the 99 to go find that one, right? That the faith is about that more so than just what we believe on these things. Sorry, Calvin. Um, but notice how much of our practices as a church, as a denomination, right? The, there's a position piece that came out in 1993 for the CRC. No, it came out in 1991, I think it was. That's Numbers are hard for me. Stupid dyslexia. Uh, um, but it was early 90s that said by mid-90s, every CRC institution should be fully compliant with the ADA. 28 years later, guess what? Denominational headquarters isn't. The seminary isn't. The university isn't. The local church I go to, I don't. I mean, it's close, right? But there's probably details there, right? So much of our church is, one of the things I love about COS, Church of the Servant, is when they built the, or for a long time they didn't want a building, when they built the building, the plat, the, there's no stairs in the building, and that's on purpose. And the platform to get up to the pulpit is shaped like a conch shell. So it's accessible by chair or walker. It's beautiful. I have seen 
people in wheelchairs get up the exact same place that everybody else can read to read the scriptures on Sunday morning. Most churches aren't like that because they're designed with a certain kind of body, a certain kind of person, and a certain kind of value in mind. When our theology is rooted in ableism, our practices are rooted in ableism. Our church has this beautiful quilt. This is my last slide. Love this quilt. Hangs on the wall a couple of times a year, part, part of the year. And it's a quilting of a painting that one of our congregants made, made by the quilting group. And it's clearly multiracial. It's clearly multi-generational because there's a baby somewhere. The only version I, picture I still had was black and white. Um, but there's somebody in a wheelchair. The picture of the community for my church is one that is intentionally structured to value, to seek out, and to affirm disabled participants. And that's lovely. And more of us should be like that too. Thank you. Whenever. Whenever or five, whichever comes earliest. <laughs> I've got three kids that are expecting pizza here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So is, is that the, just sort of a, okay. So the question is, how does some of this theology connect to, to mental health? Um, I think disability and, and mental health, mental illness, and I don't know what to say about mental health because I'm not sure what to say about health, but disability and mental illness, I think are, are two different things, but they often overlap, right? The, the, the likelihood to have anxiety uh, disorders, depression for people that are disabled is significantly higher. Why? Oh, that's because we treat people like that poorly, right? And in, in, in part. Um, and so I, I think that there can be mental illnesses that disable. I think depression can do this. I think certain kinds of anxiety can do this. Uh, uh, I think that schizophrenia can, can, can do that, right? Uh, I think that having some disabilities, especially coming to acquire a disability, can also right, like contribute to what goes on with men. Um, but, so there are two different but overlapping things. Um, I think we're also really bad as a church, as a community, about thinking about mental health and mental, mental illness kinds of issues. Um, and even sometimes um, uh, as a university, right, so, so like, I'm going to top my head here, but even sometimes as a university, right, the way that we respond to mental health crises is by employing the disability accommodation sort of framework that we have, right, which, which might be appropriate sometimes. But here's why that can be problematic. Those of you that have taken a class from me know, right? Uh, you're gonna know this next little spiel. Somebody wants to get disability accommodations here at Calvin University, they have to go get the relevant uh, diagnostic uh, tests, often at their own expense or having good parent parental insurance. Then they have to bring it to the university uh, 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 center for student success. And then they have to get the accommodations that are provided for them by this, right? And, and I love that office, I think it's great, right? But then they have to take it to their faculty member. They have to make sure that the faculty member does it. I have had multiple students tell me that they have uh, faculty that refuse to follow their documented disability accommodations. And they wanna know what to do. Make good trouble in the consequences that follow from that or like, right? And so it, for so much of both mental illness and disability, we put all the onus for, for trying to get what, we, what the community says you deserve on the person who's disadvantaged, not only by the condition, but by the entire system. 
we're not super good at thinking about that, right? So um, there's a lot that we can do to just build in either here at Calvin or our other community, right? Flexibility for this kind of, right? Um, I don't have an attendance policy in any of my classes. Because I think that attendance policies usually are really ableist and are really harmful to students with chronic illness, chronic pain, can't do it to class on time because their class is across the belt line and we've got 10 minutes to get all the way over here and they have to wait for an elevator, uh, right? Mental health challenges. And so there's a lot I think that we could do to sort of build in greater understanding, greater flexibility, but then put the burden on the system, on the community, not individualize it and make that person the person that has to go through all the hoops to get anything that, right? And, and so I think our churches are getting, or at least the churches that I've been a part of in the last decade, which is two, really, uh, have gotten better at thinking about, right? There's not the same, there's still mental health stigma. <laughs> Sorry, there's still mental illness stigma. But it's better, but it also depends on the kind of mental illness people have, right? We still stigmatize uh, schizophrenia a lot more than we do bipolar, for instance. And I think that, that's the problem. And we stigmatize intellectual disability a lot more than we do mobility disability. And I think that's a problem. So I think there's a lot of parallels, but I also think it's important to notice that like, they can intersect, but they can also be separate. Oh, uh, I have I have read fairly broadly about mental illness, um, but I am not in a good position to say definitively. Um, so I, I will. So I so what's going to be part of the fall are all those things that by their very nature get in the way of us having the right relationship with God and through God with all other people and all other creation as a whole, <laughs> right? And now, uh, as somebody that has gone through periods of significant depression in his life, I think those things have gotten in the way of right, my ability to worship or, or to be a good person. Um, so I think that often that's the result of the fall. But sometimes it's, right, it's the social conditions I have to deal with that cause the disabled, right, that cause the depression. And, and Right. So, so oftentimes it's the community, it's the environment, it's the ecology, it's the larger environment that is the problem, even in those places, right, where, where there is real suffering and real lack of flourishing and lack of shalom, right? Um, Got to get Walter Storff's favorite word in there. Yeah, Simon. Yeah, so the question uh, in a nutshell is how pain and suffering relate to this conversation, both about disability and about mental illness. Well, I mean, I'll, uh, I'm a philosopher. The, the answer is complicated, right? Uh, uh, easy, uh, but true. I mean, I think sometimes, so I do think uh, here's a place where I, as a Christian, in faith affirm things that I have no idea how they're gonna happen, right? It's almost as if faith leads to hope. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, every tear will be wiped away. I don't know what that means. I just fundamentally don't. What would it be like for the entire history of the human race to live in shalom with each other? Right? For the white Christian preacher that, that then on the weekend would lynch and justify it by the Bible, what would it be like for him to sit down at the Eucharistic banquet with the person he helped? I have no idea. Right? Much so I, I don't know what it's gonna be like to not have pain and suffering. I cannot envision it. I cannot get my mind around it. My theological imagination is significantly limited.
But so often, now there are disabilities that include chronic pain. And in my work, I say that those might be instances of what Elizabeth Barnes calls bad mate, right? Bad difference disabilities. Those are disabilities that are fundamentally bad to have apart from able to social structures. Many disabilities Barnes thinks are mere differences that become bad because of how we treat the condition, right? But chronic pain related disabilities might be instances of bad disabilities, uh, bad difference disabilities. But and in which case, those cases, yay, and I'm all for healing in those cases, if, if that's the case. But so much of the pain and suffering we, right, we do are inflicted. And even so much of the physical pain and suffering, right? Like, think back to Flint, right? There's a ton of suffering going on there, in part because the public schools aren't doing a good job for the disabled students and despite what they're supposed to be doing, right? And whose fault is that? Well... <laughs> poisoned water that caused intellectual disability, right? Some of that pain, even for physical disability, some of that suffering is not because of what God builds into the condition, but just because we're humans and we treat each other like crap a lot. Um, and that needs to be redeemed. But notice in that part, what needs to be redeemed is what humans have done and continue to do to other humans and not necessarily the, right? I think that my son does suffer for being autistic, but not because he's autistic. Because people just don't value him as much. So part of what it would be is for him to actually be valued so that the suffering that has been imposed on him by good, well-meaning, oftentimes Christian people and by extension his whole family, right? That's gotta be addressed. And what's that look like? I don't know. I affirm it on faith, but I don't know what it looks like. So but that's the short answer, but follow up. Yeah. Let me go. Yep. So again, like, I want you to not be in pain. Uh, right, and, and, and I hope for you to not be in pain, even though, right, given your condition, I, I, I don't know how the biology would work. I mean, I don't know how most of the biology would work. Um, uh, I'm trying to go back. But there's a difference. In, so I do think that it is proper to think about disability as it relates to the problem of, right? I just don't think that, like, that should be the only place we should think about disability, right? As something to be explained, right? When it comes to theodicy or or a defense from the problem of evil. Um, one of the things that, that I worry about in this area um, is that we often approach issues of the problem of evil theodicy about sort of like compensation. What's the good that would offset this? And I think that that's probably a fundamentally mistaken way to think about it. Um, the, the now late Marilyn McCord Adams, philosopher, Episcopal priest, incredibly wonderful human being, she has reframed how I think about the problem of evil. She says that the, if we think about the problem of evil in primarily this compensation, to, right, then like if there's a good that 
outweighs and justifies the evil, then I could do really bad things for you and just give you the goods, right? And like, then I haven't harmed you, right? In, in some kind of way. So she thinks that what we, instead of thinking about uh, um, compensating for harms, for evils, for suffering, we need to think about them as being, um, shoot, I'm gonna draw a blank on her term, um, defeated, there's her term. They're redeemed. The worst that humanity does in the crucifixion doesn't get compensated for. It gets fundamentally changed into something that it wasn't before. Life from death, joy from suffering, right? And so we need to defeat evils. Uh, We need to think about evils being defeated where God takes them and somehow redeems them and tells them into the story. So the way that she talks about this, right, in in relation to some of what you've said, is that God could uh, defeat some of your suffering if God could help you weave into the kind of person that looking back would endorse all of that because of the goods that has given to you and what you've grown from it. But notice that God can't defeat an evil in that way apart from your participation. You, right? You have a say in whether or not what God is doing to redeem really defeats the evil. And that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about it that I think is really attractive. And Aaron Cobb and I have written a paper a number of years ago. We started talking about starting to think about philosophy in philosophy of religion along the ideas of of defeat rather than compensation. So I got a a paper that starts to go some way towards that. Kevin and then Ellie again. Yep. Marilyn McCord Adams. Um, she started off her career as Marilyn McCord, M little C, C O R D, and then she married Bob Adams. So now she's McCord Adams. Um, yeah, and, and wonderful human being. Uh, she, um, she got a book of prayers when she was taught at, uh, at uh, uh, Christ Church, Oxford, I think it was. So she was actually like the parish priest and has a fabulous book of prayers too. So she's a wonderful human and prayer and philosopher. And I'm drawing a blank on the title of her book, but yeah. Ellie. Uh, Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so kind of two problems. One, what are some of those things that you see in your personal life? Um, like kind of ways that are really good things to people and also how can people find that? Yeah, great question. Um I as with many folks started thinking about disability when it affected my family. I mean, for as long as I've known my wife, her dad, her, her father has been one-legged. He stepped on a landmine in Korea and was one-legged. And there's some really funny stories uh, related, right? But like, so I've had disabled people in my life for 26 years, right? But it didn't really hit home as something serious until our son was born and diagnosed. And like when he was diagnosed with his genetic uh, um, condition, our geneticist said there is not an instance of this in the medical literature. So Go figure it out. Now there's 60 diagnosed cases worldwide that we know of. Um, and so often what I, I, I tried to understand, so I mean, I'm an academic. I went and just started reading tons of stuff, right? But most folks that write scholarly work about disabilities aren't themselves disabled, right? And so much of the good medical literature that is important to know, right? Like a lot of people with our son's condition have a heart valve issue. <laughs> well, we had to go get him, right? He doesn't have that kidney problems, 
but so much of the medical establishment is rooted in the sort of the bad disability kind of mentality, right? In the medical model of, of, of disability. So what I had to do is I've started working on disability academically is I seek out and read disabled voices and draw on them. Um, Young is, to the best of my knowledge, not himself disabled, and able, and, uh, but has a disabled child. Iceland's disabled. Um, uh, who else did I have in there? Uh, uh, Talia Lewis, uh, the, the, the poet, Amy, Amy Kent. Yeah, Kenny. So there's just so much, right? Um, I mean, I'm exactly the wrong person to, in some ways, I'm the exact wrong person to teach a class either on philosophy of gender or disability, right? No, I mean, I, I say this every semester that I teach the Phil of Gender class. Every single marker of cultural privilege I have, white, male, non-disabled, uh, highly educated, Christian, right? Middle class, I mean, it's just like, I, I have it all. And so, as another case, right, read the people that have experienced it. That doesn't mean they're right. Not all disabled people think about disability any more than every female thinks about uh, sex in the same way, right? Um, but those folks are often, for all these cultural social reasons, right, the folks that don't have the book contracts or the teaching positions or all this kind of stuff. One of the things I try to do every semester um, is when I teach that class is I have one of my disabled friends zoom in and teach the class for a day. And I just basically tell them, I've already got John Altman lined up for this, uh, for this fall. John is wonderful. Talk about whatever, because <laughs> my students will benefit. So that's one thing that we need to do, right? Uh, um, there's two parts to your question. What's the second part? Uh, how do we invite? Oh, how do we invite? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we, <sighs> We actually have to, some of what I'm going to say is like the trite easy answer that's yes, but like putting it into practice is hard, right? Uh, and I'm well aware of that, um, even though I hate that about all sorts of things, right? We can't expect disabled folks to suddenly like flip a switch and feel welcome at our churches. Some of them have 40 years of not being welcome. We got to leave the 99. We got to go out. We got to invest in these folks. We've got to build community, build friendships, earn their trust, and only when they know they're not our pet project, try to bring them back into the church. It's a multi-year commitment. Um, in the same way that we actively seek out to recruit minority faculty, actively seek out and recruit disabled faculty. Uh, how many of you, right, the, the, the data, according to the uh, federal government, is that approximately, depending on what stat you use, either 21 to 24.3% of the adult American population has a disability. Think of the last four pastors you've had. One of those four disabled? You might not know, right, because not everybody knows, <laughs> um, right? But we've got decades centuries in this country alone of marginalizing folks for certain social roles based on, the, on, 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 on right, their identity. And it's going to take a long time to fix, right? I mean, I really do think the fact that, um, oh goodness, I try not to get myself in trouble. I really do. I fail. <laughs> I was interviewed for the Chimes yesterday, yesterday, the day before. Maybe it's because I have a history of saying things to the Chimes. <laughs> right? Uh, um, and it was about thinking about disability on campus and, and, and this talk. And um, I mean, I've got the documents where the CRC actively lobbied the federal government to be exempt from anti-discrimination legislation. And we succeeded. What? Sure. Yeah. 
Um, and then, right, the ADA, that was in 1989. The ADA was passed in 1990. Legally, Calvin has no obligations to care about disability because we're a religious nonprofit, right, church-related uh, institution. In either 93 or 99, the CRC, sorry, 91 or 93, the CRC paper came out that said by sometime in the mid 90s, every cert, right? And, and when I was being interviewed for the Chimes, I said, one of the things we need to do is as a denomination, we need to publicly repent of the role that we played in making anti-disability uh, anti discrimination legal for churches and actually live up to the thing that we said now 28 years ago. And we need to do that as Calvin too. And Calvin is supposed to be as a university for the denomination, it's supposed to help it think about these things, right? The university should play a leadership role on some of this. And we just need to, right? I mean, we need to do better. We need to not talk better. Sometimes we're good at the, at the talking. We need to actually prom we need to repent and promise and then hold ourselves to some of the stuff. And it's going to cost us money, and it's going to cost us time, and it's going to cost us a lot of work. And if we say we are who we say we are, and we want to live into that, we're like, tough. And it's hard. Like, I realize it's hard. I've been thinking about this stuff for seven or eight years, and I still don't always know how to accommodate certain disabilities and in interpersonal interactions. Right? It, it is hard work. But then we make the recipient, so we need to listen to the person that has the experience, but not put the entire onus on them to fix the problem, right? And, and so we got to do better. We've got to know who to listen to, know who, and this is one of the things I love that, you know, we had two fantastic uh, uh, killer in the colloquial sense of the term, January series speakers on disability with Amy Kinney and, um, uh, Sarah Hendren, I, I was on Zoom with her uh, earlier this week, and I teach her book, What Can a Body Do, in, in my disability course. That's good. Like, we, like, I think that's good, right? Um, but, like, the denomination, the American church, whatever exactly that means, Christ, Christendom, we've got a long way to go on a lot of this stuff. And, and, too often we give ourselves passes because we talk about how we mean well. And good intentions are really problematic, right? I mean, good intentions are better than bad intentions, right? Um, I would rather somebody unintentionally kick me in the shin than in intentionally kick me in the shin. But better is not good, right? And we gotta think about this stuff as fundamentally systemic and structural and communal. And the, but I meant well is too often give me a pass. And we need to admit that and we need to stop doing it. But we do it so, and I'm sure I do it too, uh, right? So the, it's the royal we there and not the like projecting we. Um, we need to do better. All right, that's time. <laughs>